Thank you for joining us today to our first episode of our live uh, streaming uh, live interview series. Today we're pleased to have Rachel Bayani uh, from the Baha'i International Community. Uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation. We have received a few questions from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, online viewers and, uh, and our followers on our Facebook page. And, uh, and we actually invite you to uh, leave your questions, uh, uh, ask your questions to Rochelle by leaving comments on the, under the video on our Facebook page. So welcome, Rochelle. Thank you for being here today with us. Thank you, Francesco, for having me. It's lovely to be here. So let's start with the, uh, with the, with the questions. Can you share a little bit about yourself and uh, your professional background? Sure. So um, I grew up in Luxembourg and um, have come here in 2004. So I've been in Brussels actually since 2004. Um, I'm, I'm married, I have two kids. And in terms of my professional background, um, <clears throat> before 2004, for four years I was working in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. I worked with um, UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, with the UN peacekeeping mission there, but also with the European Union police mission. And in 2004, I came to Brussels, I joined the Luxembourg permanent representation to the European Union and worked there as a justice and home affairs counselor. And I have a legal background. So do you have quite an experience already in international affairs and here in, uh, in Brussels as well. Let's talk about the Baha'i faith. What are the uh, basic beliefs of the Baha'i faith? There seems to be a focus on providing service and forming unity among people. What, uh, what are the main reasons for that? Sure. So maybe just to, to start with, um, well, the, the fact that, that Baha'is believe that there's only one God, and, and that God is the creator of the universe. And he's all-knowing, is all-merciful, and all-loving. And um, throughout the ages, he has really sent um, a series of messengers, of divine messengers, and we call them manifestations of God because they're uniquely able to manifest um, the will of God and really express to humanity what God wants from us. And amongst these manifestations we have, um, just to name a few, uh, Abraham, Moses, Jesus Christ, Muhammad, and now for us also Baha'u'llah. And um, the teachings of these manifestations, they're really um, able to cultivate humanity's spiritual, intellectual, and moral capacities. And maybe a few words about Baha'u'llah. He was, he was born in 1817 in Iran. And in his writings, he outlined a, a framework for the development of a sort of a global civilization. And his, his teachings, they talk about the agreement of, of science and religion, um, the elimination of, of prejudice, uh, the universal education for all, the equality of, of men and women. And for these teachings, he was actually um, imprisoned, tortured, and exiled for 40 years. And what is really at the heart of the Baha'i faith is this notion that we all belong to one human family. And, and, and that notion, that principle, is, is pivotal. And really all of the teachings of the Baha'i faith, they center around that, that notion. And Baha'u'llah, he said uh, that our vision must be world embracing, and that really we shouldn't um, find glory in the fact that we love our country, but we should sort of find pride in the fact that we really love all of humankind. And, y you know, if we look at history, um, it's so far recorded, the, the experience of, of, of tribes, of cultures, of, of classes, of, of nations. And really for the first time in the history of humanity, in, in this century, actually, um, you know, the history of humanity as one people is starting. And, and it's a very sort of co confusing period in, in some ways, because we're really going from um, you know, those structures that allowed us to function as nation states and we're still sort of functioning according to those structures but on the other hand we've become an inter interdependent community but we haven't found out ways of functioning along those sort of, um, you know, premises yet 
And, and so it's this, this period of, of transition, of adolescence, actually, what we call it. We're no longer a child, but we haven't become an adult yet either. That is profoundly um, un unsettling. And on one hand, you know, everything that we believed in, it, it's crumbling, and it's no longer able to meet the needs of the world today. And on the other hand, you have really this other process, and we call it the process of integration, where people are trying to respond to this growing interdependence of humanity. And this is what um, the Baha'is and the, the work of the Baha'is very much um, focuses on. And I forgot your service question. Well, we'll uh, we, can, uh, we can definitely go uh, over that uh, uh, later on. But thank you very much. That's wonderful. And I can say that uh, after all the time that we spent together working uh, in a, on a number of issues that I can actually see uh, some of those principles in action in, uh, in your work. Um, how did you personally become a Baha'i? Um, well, in, in order to sort of explain that, maybe I can just say that, that in, in Baha'u'llah's revelation, it is affirmed that really our essential identity is the identity of our soul. We all have an, an immortal and a rational soul. And that soul is entirely outside um, of sort of the order of this physical world. And it is actually um, to the powers of that soul that um, progress in this society takes place. And just to read one very brief um, you know, excerpt, it says that the soul can discover the reality of things and penetrate the mysteries of existence. All sciences, knowledge, arts, wonders, institutions, discoveries and enterprises come from the exercised intelligence of the rational soul. So in other words, this means that really every one of us is responsible for his or her own spiritual growth. And that also means that um, we have to make a very informed choice as to um, what, what kind of spiritual paths we want to tread. And in the Baha'i faith, um, a child reaches spiritual maturity at the age of 15, and it's as of then, it can really make an enlightened choice as to um, what its spiritual future should look like. And, and that's what I did. I grew up in a Baha'i family, and um, of course, my education was along, I mean, in accordance with those principles, but I was very much encouraged um, to, to think for myself and really independently search for the truth. That's very interesting. It's also similar to, uh, to what we Mormons believe in terms of being, uh, being the masters of our own uh, development, being the ones to be responsible. And also it's interesting on the age of maturity that you mentioned, as mm. uh, you said, 15, and uh, uh, we, we have that age set at eight. Um, so that's, very, that's very interesting. Uh, Rachel, what makes equality between men and women such a central principle in the Baha'i faith? Well, Baha'u'llah really said, and, and just to remember that this was in, in the 1800s in, in Iran, he said that women and men have always been and will always be equal in the sight of God. Um, and, and really, there's this comparison in, in, in the Baha'i writings about humanity <clears throat> having these two wings and, and being like a bird. And um, unless both wings are not equal, equally developed, that bird cannot fly. So actually, society as a whole cannot progress if, if, if women don't enjoy the same um, privileges and, and, and rights and cannot contribute in the same way than men can. And actually, um, you know, without the contribution of both on equal footing, also sort of both are not able to express their capacities at, at the fullest. So um, this is something that, that is, is very much at the heart of the, the Baha'i teachings and that we're um, working on. That leads us in a way to our next question, which is also very dear to members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What is the role of the family in the Baha'i faith? Mm. So, so the family is really seen as the, the nucleus of society. And unless you don't have a healthy family, it's very difficult to have an, a well-functioning society. And, and it is in the family setting 
that really um, sort of do those capacities and qualities are, are, are conveyed to children that allow them um, to, to, to interact in a certain way in, in society. And, and so um, Baha'i families are very um, you know, conscious of the fact that they need to remain united. So the unity of the family is very important. And, um, and really it, this, this sense of sort of um, seeing humanity as one is conveyed to children so that really they see all human beings as, as equal and actually as members of their extended family. But then also they, they learn that their life is not just about um, themselves but really that the purpose of life and, and just to answer the previous um, question on service is, is, is twofold. So there's this twofold moral purpose in life. On one hand, um, you, you, you sort of make sure um, that you refine your own inner uh, qualities and, and your character, but that must go hand in hand with um, trying to serve humanity. Both, both are re related and both progress simultaneously. Thank you, Thank you Rasha. Uh, now let's talk about your organization, the Baha'i International Community. How, um, what is it and uh, how was it established? So, so actually the, the Baha'i International Community is, is really the, the body or, or the organization, if you like, that, that sort of you know, represents the, the vision contained um, w within the Baha'i Faith at the level of um, international organizations such as the United Nations or in this case, for example, the, the European Union. And um, it, it also represents this, this worldwide Baha'i community um, who, whose members come from every background, every culture, every ethnicity, and, and really are a, a cross-section of, of humanity. And um, in, in terms of sort of the, the more, um, the, the, let's say, the, the, the legal side of it, if you like, it was um, registered uh, w with the UN uh, as an NGO in 18, no, sorry, in 1948. And um, it has really, for the past 70 years, the Baha'i International Community at the UN has, has been involved in, in discourses that take place there, whether they're relating to gender equality, to development, to human rights. But now, also more recently, the Baha'i International Community has opened offices, regional offices, so uh, in, in Brussels, in Addis Abeba, and also in Jakarta. So you're quite represented all over in all the major organizations. Now this is kind of a articulated question, so uh, what is the main focus for the Baha'i International Community here in Brussels uh, at the European Union and uh, um, yeah. Sure, um, so, so we, we have several themes that, that we are, we're full I mean, working on currently, and that doesn't mean that we won't expand and that there's not other themes that are very important, but it's just that these themes we've chosen for a number of reasons at this particular time. So one of the themes is, is, is peace and really the, the role of the European Union also in, in relation to that and in relation to, to peace building. And, um, and, and recently um, there was a, a the European Union Global Strategy on Foreign and Security Policy that was issued. And if you look at the strategy, this, this notion of resilience is, is really prominent in it. And uh, to us it's a very interesting notion because it actually um, ultimately sort of means that, that um, th there is capacity inherent uh, in every uh, population, so in, in every human being. And it, it really, one of the defining characteristics that has emerged in, in that conversation on resilience is to the, this attempt to look at strength in, in conflict-ridden uh, communities rather than at, at fragility. And um, it, this actually very much reinverses how we, we approach things. And so uh, in, in the coming days, actually in, in two days, we're, we're having, uh, we organized a, a meeting together with um, the Conference of European Churches, the Commission of the Bishops Conferences of the EU, and the Quaker Council for European Affairs on really, you know, what is the role 
of this notion of resilience with relation to faith-based organizations? And actually, how does faith allow us to identify um, strength? And uh, <clears throat> in all of these activities, um, what, may, what, what are the organizations that Baha'i uh, work together with? There's really um, a number of organizations. We, we work with um, both academia, we work for, with the European Union institutions, with relevant bodies of the European Union, but also with the all of civil society that circles around uh, the, the European Union, um, such as you know, human rights organizations, but also faith-based organizations. And just to mention that also the, the Baha'i international community is not the Brussels office is not just a representation to the European Union, but also to the Council of Europe and the OSCE. And uh, as you approach all of these organizations, with, um, these organizations, the European institutions, uh, what are the main challenges experienced by the uh, members of the Baha'i Faith internationally? So internationally, um, I think <clears throat> One particular challenge is in terms of the, 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 the rights of, of um, the, the Baha'is is the, the situation in, in Iran uh, where since the, the revolution in, in 79 the persecution of the Baha'is has really become a, a matter of, of state policy. Um, so so Baha'is don't only not have the right to practice their faith, they're actually stripped from all of their, their other civil rights. And, and this is of particular concern um, to us. Thank you. Uh, that leads us to um, kind of our last questions before we uh, move on to the questions received by uh, and submitted by our viewers. Generally speaking, what role, on your opinion, in your opinion, does religion play in advancing the common good? Thank you. That's a very interesting question. Um, because if we, we also look at the the European discourse on, on you know, religion, um, it's actually, and somebody put it very nicely, he said it, it's sort of in this conceptual straitjacket. Religion is either seen as a, a victim or as an oppressor. And um, so it, it's either a question of human rights or a question of extremism or whatever the vocabulary um, is that is most appropriate to be used in that, in that sphere. But, um, but, but basically, for us, it's important that um, we also look at just simply what is the, the, the role of religion in, in society and how really can um, sort of that, that positive force of motivation that is contained within religion, how can it be, um, you know, how can we draw on it and how can it find um, expression? Because we, we just see, I mean, for understandable reason, there is sort of a wariness in, in Europe a, a, about religion, and, and that is, is, is understandable. Um, but f for, and for many years, we would have thought that as the forces of modernity advanced, also religion and its important declines. But we, we see that this is um, not the case, and quite to the contrary. And I mean, there's many reasons now why I won't go into them right now. But um, we see that religion is as important as it's always been, and it's not going away. So, and besides that, it, it really has the capacity to transform society. And so how do we um, meaningfully uh, draw on it is, is one of the things that we're particularly interested in. Thank you, Rochelle. Well, now we have received quite a few uh, questions. Uh, some were submitted to, to us before. Uh, we have a few um, that are commenting, are asking questions during, the, during our live broadcast. So the first question is from uh, uh, Richard, uh, who asked, I have met some wonderful people from the Baha'i Faith. Thank you for sharing your time and insights in this interview. My question is, what do you think people of faith can do to move beyond interfaith dialogue to meaningful interfaith action that does not compromise anyone's belief, but will strengthen communities in lasting ways. Thank you. Richard, what's his name? Richard. Th thank yeah. you, Richard. I think that that's a very, um, you know, very important and, and profound question. And actually, I mean, we, we believe it's no longer enough for um, religious communities to be simply encouraged to re respect each other. 
I think the, the, the needs of, of the world today are such that we need this profound um, ties of, of friendship and collaboration between religious communities. And as I mentioned previously, one, one challenge is really how do we draw on this constructive um, power of, of religion. And then you see that it's very difficult for religious communities to do that on their own. Uh, there's such a diversity of, of you know, faith-based organizations and I think we actually need to all really sit together and really think about how we can best contribute um, to, to, to society. Thank you. Well, uh, we have uh, two more questions. One from uh, Nebel um, that asks, what drives the Baha'i commitment to freedom of religion or belief? Is that the Neville I know? That's the Neville we know. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Neville. And it's good to hear from you. Um, so maybe just to say that, that at the heart of, of our work on freedom of religion and belief is this, this understanding that you know, human consciousness really distinguishes itself by this, this search for, for meaning and as such to hold a belief of one's choosing. So that without this capacity to, to search for meaning and to choose your belief, um, other capacities inherent in, in the human being cannot find expression and as such society really loses out. So um, that is why we're so particularly concerned about this, this particular freedom also. And um, together also with, with Francesco, um, we are a member of the European Platform Against Religious Intolerance and, and Discrimination, in short, EPRIT. And um, EPRIT is a network of human rights and faith-based organizations really trying to promote this freedom in European Union settings. Thank you, Rochelle. Ralph from Germany asks, how much of your work relates to educating lawmakers about human rights and the situation of the adherence uh, of your faith in Iran? So there is quite a, a significant part of our work um, that, um, that, that looks at this particular question. But as I, um, if I may say, the, the bulk of our work is really to participate in, in those questions that, that are um, sort of relevant to, um, let's say, the, the well-being of society as a whole. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, the, um, we have one question from Ethan uh, from the United Kingdom. He's asked, and this probably can connect with what you already said at the beginning, uh, as someone who is completely unfamiliar with the Baha'i faith, could you please provide a basic overview of the history, beliefs, and traditions of your religion? Is there anything else that you would like to add to that, to what you said at the beginning? Um, just, just maybe to, to elaborate on the fact that, that you know, Baha'u'llah was, was born in Tehran in 1817, and um, he was born under the name of Mirza Hossein Ali, and um, he was born into a noble family, um, but really, rather than pursuing this, this career in government that was foreseen for him, he decided to, to, to help the poor. And as he, he became more and more, or his, his vision, his message become more and more um, famous and popular, um, so also became sort of the, the forces of opposition. And, and he was exiled and banned from uh, Persia at the time. And um, then throughout the Ottoman Empire and um, in 1868 he um, ended up, he was back to what was then a notorious prison city of Akka and he spent the rest of his life there um, as, as a prisoner. And in terms of maybe just, just briefly, I mean I mentioned a lot about the teachings but the traditions is also maybe to just say that acts of devotion are actually in, inherent to, to religious life. And so whether it, it, it's prayer, whether it's meditation or, or pilgrimage or fasting, these are all part of, of a Baha'i religious life. Thank you. Uh, I actually have um, one question to, uh, to ask you. Um, 
youth, as, youth are very important uh, in our faith. So I wanted to ask, what are some examples about the youth uh, contribute in the Baha'i community? So that, that is a very um, g- good question in, in terms of that, you know, the, the role of youth is, is pivotal. Um, and, and they're actually at the forefront of this uh, community building endeavors that, that, that the Baha'is are trying together with their friends, their contacts, and all, and their neighbors to promote at, at the local level where um, they're trying to really create this, this common vision between people of all backgrounds as to what con- kind of society we would like to, to live in and how can we ensure that our lives are not just lived for ourselves but really in service um, to humanity. And, and we see that, that the role of youth in there is, is, is key because they have a, um, a, a sense of justice and a sense of desire to serve that, is, um, um, that we need to tap into. And, and so we, not just to see the youth as, um, you know, as, as contributors to the econ- economy or being concerned about how um, you know, they can be employed once they finish studies, because a lot of focus is, is on that if we look at uh, policies but really how can they use their talents and capacities to contribute to the betterment of society. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, I have a question concerning the organization, uh, the structural organization of the Baha'i faith. We are used to um, organized churches, and how, how is the Baha'i faith organized? Yes, so, so really the, the affairs of the, the, the Baha'i community, they're administer through a system of, of institutions and, and that system that's known as the Baha'i administrative order um, it, it is found in the, the writings of, of Baha'u'llah him, himself and um, basically today um, the supreme body of, of, of the Baha'i community is the Universal House of Justice and it's the central governing body and under its guidance you have electors, elected bodies at national and at local level who um, exercise legislative, executive and judicial authority. But you also have a, a body of, of individuals that exercise the function of, of, of advice. And, and so both those systems under the guidance of this supreme body is what we call the Baha'i administrative order. Thank you, Rochelle. Well, to close, to close the interview, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you, you talked about, a lot about service. And um, could you provide uh, a few examples of how the Baha'is organize service projects or um, service to the community? Um, sure. I, I think it's, <clears throat> it's throughout, really, the, the global community and, and in every single setting and, and in villages and cities, um, Baha'is are sort of thinking and with others. So they never do things on their own. So it's, it's always with, with those that, that surround us um, about how really we can build towards this, this, this world that is um, sort of that, that views the whole of humanity as, as one family. And um, in terms of just more, more concrete projects, so for example, you talked about the youth. Um, you know, the youth are encouraged to, to, to think about um, how they can also accompany younger youth in trying to, you know, just, just understand the society in, in which they live and, and see, you know, what, what are sort of forces that, that are um, less you know, constructive or what are constructive forces and, and how this younger youth can already really try and understand um, how they can really um, sort of prepare themselves for um, thinking very profoundly how to transform um, society. So there, there's a number of um, sort of initiatives um, like that and I would love to at some point you know, go, go into more details. But um, I think for the purpose of this, yes. No, that would be uh, that would be great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rachel, for uh, for your time uh, today, uh, for um, sharing your perspective, your experience, 
And um, we'd like also to thank all those who have participated during the live streaming uh, by submitting their questions. And uh, we from the European Union Office of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Brussels um, uh, are very uh, excited for, uh, for having uh, had you here today with us and uh, look forward to uh, talking to you in the future.